Well, good morning again, church. If you have your Bibles, open up to Genesis 39. Genesis 39 is where we're going to be as we continue our series of family for the world. We've got a lot of ground to cover today. We've got a lot of text to look through, so I want to go ahead and pray for us so we can go ahead and dive in. So would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for these baptisms that we got to celebrate. We're thankful for how you're working in Xavier and Sterling's hearts and their families in this church. And so Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless us with your grace. Lord, you are our power and our strength every day. We have nothing to offer, we have nothing to give. So Jesus, we are completely dependent upon you even now especially now in your Holy Spirit as we look at your word. Would you enlighten our minds to your truth? It's in your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, as I said, we've been uh, walking through this series, A Family for the World. So we've been looking at Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to go all the way to the end. And what we're seeing so far are kind of a lot of bad examples <laughs> We uh, have seen the family of Abraham and his sons and grandchildren, and, and now we're getting into his great-grandchildren, and we're, and we're seeing kind of, uh, well, not exactly the most outstanding examples of how to live a life of faith. Now, the caveat there is, overall, the picture is moving forward pretty well, but that's because of God, right? God himself is faithful to these individuals and to this family. And so he has a master plan to take this family that started with Abraham, turn it into a nation, and that nation of people will one day become the church and it will one day be the light that the world desperately needs pointing to Jesus. That is the plan. That is the family for the world. But today, we finally get to a better example. Now, remember last week where we left off. We left off with Joseph, a 17-year-old kid who was sold into slavery by his own brothers, right? He, they sold him into slavery with this caravan on its way to Egypt. And so when we, when we finished looking at the story last week, we see Joseph is on his way to Egypt. But as we're going to see today, Joseph is a refreshing example because now in Egypt, as an adult, he's been through so much pain, he's been through so much testing, yet his life is defined by integrity and godly character. And so I want us to take a closer look at the life of Joseph, particularly three separate scenes that we see between chapters 39 and 41. And these scenes occur in those years following after he was sold into slavery. He's now in Egypt. So three different scenes we're going to look at, and then we're going to kind of make some points at the end to talk about what we, what we read. So we're going to go a little fast, all right? Is that okay? All right, scene one happens in a place called Potiphar's house. Potiphar is the master of Joseph. Joseph is his servant. And so Joseph works there on the property of Potiphar. Potiphar is in charge of the Egyptian guard, all right? Genesis 39, we're gonna read verses one through 23. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. I mean, so that's pretty remarkable, right? Let's stop right there. That's pretty remarkable. Joseph went from being a 17-year-old kid betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, and now look at him. Now he's still a servant, right? But he's gaining the trust of his master. He's given authority over the house of Potiphar, who is captain of the entire Egyptian guard. Now, let's skip down uh, to the second part of verse six. 
Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, He has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home, and she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. So in a terrible turn of events, Joseph goes from being the most beloved of all of Potiphar's servants, given all of this responsibility and authority in Potiphar's house because he had been trustworthy, right? But what's happening here? This is a false accusation. We read what actually happened, but Potiphar's wife is saying that something different happened. So Joseph is falsely accused of trying to commit adultery. And Potiphar, the husband, he believes his wife, and so he throws Joseph into prison. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. (laughs) How about that? I mean, Joseph is wrongly accused. He's falsely condemned. He's thrown into prison. And yet even there, people recognize his leadership. But what do we see success attributed to here? The author is very clear. The Lord is with Joseph. The Lord is causing this success and blessing him because of his obedience. Joseph is obviously a great leader. People trust him. People see his integrity, but the Lord is with him. That's scene one. Scene two, the prison. Now, for sake of time, we're going to skip over chapter 40 where Joseph is in prison. I'll give you a quick summary. He's in prison in chapter 40, so we're going to go to 41. But it turns out, while he's in prison, the guy who once was a kid, a 17-year-old kid having these big dreams, remember, remember that last week, and sharing those dreams with his brothers, and that's what made them angry, because in the dreams, his brothers were bowing down to him. Turns out, Joseph is not only a dreamer, he is also really good at interpreting other people's dreams. So he interprets the dreams of two of his fellow prisoners, one of which is the former cupbearer to Pharaoh himself. And so that cupbearer to Pharaoh was in prison for doing something wrong. We're not exactly told 
But he ends up being released from prison and is reinstated to his job. He gets his job back, all right? So now, with that in mind, chapter 41. Here we go, scene two. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. Now, two years. Okay, Joseph, let's just let that saturate in our minds. Joseph has been falsely imprisoned for two whole years His life seems to be at the lowest low. Two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump. That's how you want your cows, right? And they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke. That's quite the dream, right? I think I had one sort of like this one time, except the cows were holding uh, signs that said, eat more chicken, right? (laughs) I'm just kidding. Verse five, and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning, his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. These are some weird dreams. Skinny cows eating fat cows, bad corn eating good corn, right? What's going on? Well, the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh's cupbearer, remember? He was in jail, in prison that I just told you about with Joseph when Joseph interpreted his dream. So now he's working for Pharaoh again and he's like, ooh, I know a guy, right? He's like, I remember this guy. He interpreted my dream. I bet he can interpret your dream. So look at this, look down at verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So, Pharaoh tells Joseph his dreams, all right? Now skip down to verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one, Joseph tells Pharaoh. Now look down to verse 29. Joseph interprets the dream. Here he goes. There will come... Seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, there will arise seven years of famine. And all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. So now you see why those ugly skinny cows are swallowing up the plump attractive cows, right? The famine is going to be so bad that the seven years of great harvest will almost be forgotten. He says the famine will consume the land and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow for it will be very severe. Verse 32, and the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers of the land and take one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and storing up grain and under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that in the land or so that the land may not perish through the famine. So not only does Joseph interpret Pharaoh's dream that there's these seven years of of good harvest and plenty followed by seven years of famine. He also, you see that? He also gives him a wonderful plan 
to survive the next 14 years. That's scene two. Third and final, scene three. The palace. Continuing in chapter 41, verse 37. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this? In whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. That's a big promotion. (laughs) Joseph is pulled out of prison. The next thing he knows, he is second in command of the whole Egyptian empire. Only below Pharaoh himself. Verse 41, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot. And they called out before him, Bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. That's scene three. So Joseph impresses Pharaoh so much that now he's second in charge. And when people, when Joseph passes by in his chariot, people bow on their knee. Who would have seen that coming? 17-year-old kid making his older brothers mad, telling them his dreams gets betrayed by them, thrown into a pit, left for dead, ends up being sold into slavery, and look at him now. And if that's a rags to riches story, if I've ever heard of one. But I want us to look closely today, not, not so much at the details of the circumstances, as much as the details of Joseph's heart. What can we learn from the heart of Joseph and apply to our own hearts as well. Well, you know, I, I, think there's one, I think there's one main emphasis in these three scenes, across these three scenes, and it's this. Godly character flows out of a supreme love for God. So let me state that maybe even another way. Integrity, integrity, honesty, obedience to the Lord. Godly character That only flows out of a true, supreme love, not for anything else in this world, but for God alone. How was Joseph able to live a life in the midst of these terrible circumstances he had to go through? I mean, there were a few years of his life where I think any one of us would have been tempted to give up completely. We had already been betrayed by our own family forsaken by them, thrown into a pit, left for dead, sold by them as if they care nothing about us. And then, once we finally see some progress in our lives and kind of working our way up the ladder, we get falsely accused of something we didn't do. And then we're, and then we're thrown in prison for two years at least. I mean, which one of us could handle that emotionally and psychologically? Who could handle that in here? But Joseph persevered with consistent obedience. How did he do that? I think the key to understanding how is found in Genesis 39 at the end of verse 9. When he was being tempted by Potiphar's wife, look at what he said. Did you notice this? Did you catch this? He said, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. You see, this is very telling because Joseph's greatest concern with his temptation was not upsetting Potiphar. Oh, I can't do this because I might lose my job. That wasn't his number one motivation for not doing this. It wasn't because, well, I don't want to complicate my life with drama. That wasn't his motivation either. Joseph's greatest concern For fleeing that temptation was based on his greatest love. His love was for God, not his position that he had attained in life 
or his reputation that he attained in life. Those things were good and fine, but his greatest love was not himself and attaining position and power. His greatest love was God himself. And he says, how could I do this against God? How could I do this against the one I love the most? Joseph didn't want to break the heart of God. He didn't want to sin against him because the Lord was his supreme love. You know, in Psalm chapter 51, in Psalm 51, it's a very popular psalm, King David wrote, after he failed where Joseph succeeded. So if you're familiar with the Old Testament, with the Bible, King David was king of Israel, and he did fall into temptation and did commit adultery. But he repented, he confessed his sin, and he was forgiven. He realized what he had done. First and foremost, in Psalm 51, he says that it was an offense against God himself. David cried out to God and said this. He said, against you and you only have I sinned. And that's not to say that other people weren't hurt. Absolutely other people were hurt. Devastatingly. And it caused great Terrible turmoil in David's life. It ruined his life to many, in many ways. And the life of others. He took someone's life. But ultimately, David knew, against you and you only have I sinned. First and foremost, this is an offense against my God. You see, here's the deal for us. Here's what we do. You and I, we, we obey our greatest love. Whatever it is, we are obedient to a point, to whatever love truly captivates our hearts. So whether that is money or sex or power, or maybe it's just your image, you know, like the image who you want others to perceive you to be, whatever it is, we are obedient to that idol in our hearts and we will submit ourselves to it we will make sacrifices for it we will obey it we have to obey something we're not god we are creator we are creation right he is the creator we are the created beings we are designed to obey something so everyone in here is obeying something it's just either god or whatever else is ruling your heart that dictates our life Right, And so what we have to see is if God himself is our supreme love, then though we will be far from perfect, absolutely, we will still struggle with sin, yes, but we will want to truly please him and the thought of sinning against him and breaking his heart, that should disgust us just as it did Joseph. So I want to ask before we go any further, Are you disgusted at the thought of sinning against God and not just concerned about the consequences that may come after? If our attitude towards sin is lax, I think that reveals where our heart really is. God is not our supreme love. But if he truly is, then we'll take sin seriously we won't try to sweep it under a rug and we'll want, we'll want to live for him. And that'll be evident that we have that desire, though we will not always succeed and be great at it. We will have the desire, just like Joseph did. So godly character flows out of a supreme love for God. Now that is, that, that's the main truth connecting these three scenes that we looked at. But I want us to look even closer at at three other truths that are demonstrated by this. So so we see this godly character flowing out of Joseph's heart. His love is dictating his behavior, and we see that demonstrated in three ways. Number one, we see him fleeing temptation. So Potiphar's wife, she was persistent. She persistently presented herself to Joseph She wanted to have an affair with him, right? But but what did Joseph do when she made her advance? He literally ran out of the house, right? He literally fled and ran away. It says he fled in verse 12 of Genesis 39. He fled and got out of the house. You see, why, again, comes back to that main truth. 
It's his love for God was greater than any, any desire for lust. You see, Joseph knew. He knew the destructive danger of this particular kind of sin. And as I just mentioned, we saw in King David's life the danger and the devastation that comes. But more than anything, Joseph wanted to please God in this moment. And so we can't, we, we can't preach through books of the Bible and, and passages of Scripture and details like this and not talk about it. So I want to ask you, what about you? You know, temptation comes in many forms. It comes in all kinds of arenas of life. You could be tempted to cheat on your taxes, right? You could be tempted to lie to someone. You could be tempted to, you know, cut corners at your job and kind of present this false image of yourself. There's all kinds of temptations. But, but since this story is specifically about sexual temptation, I want to address that for a moment. And I want you to ask yourself, am I fleeing? Am I fleeing from that? Because it is so dangerous. It will absolutely ruin your life. It will ruin your life. And some of you need to confess. You know, and I think we, we immediately think of like, well, having an affair or something like that, but pornography is an issue. And other forms of inappropriate images in a room this size, somebody is struggling. It's one of the greatest sins among Christians that we're all scared to talk about. But we need to flee. We need to flee this. And how do you flee? How, how do you flee any form of temptation? Well, listen, a great first step is realizing the brevity, the severity of this particular sin and confessing it to the Lord and telling him to, and asking him for help. That's step one. Listen, step two is getting a Christian brother or sister to walk alongside you and letting them know, I have this issue and I just, I so want to overcome it, but I need your help. And so if you're a male, you talk to a male. If you're a female, you talk to a female. And you just ask, just ask for help. No one's going to shame you. You don't have to be ashamed because the blood of Jesus will cover your sin always and forever. But we have to flee and we have to set up safeguards in our lives. We need each other. We need brothers and sisters in Christ to rely on and help us through all the temptations of life. That's the godly response. That's how a true love for God can be restored. Joseph fled temptation because he ultimately did not want to sin against God himself. You can do that but you're gonna need some help and that's okay. Confess whatever sin is tempting your heart. Confess it to the Lord and then confess it to a brother or a sister in Christ and ask them to help you. We will because we love you. We want to help you. Number two, we see godly character demonstrated through humility. In Genesis 41 verse 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh. What did he say? When, when, when Pharaoh was heaping praise on Joseph, who did Joseph heap praise on? Not himself. He said what? It's not in me. It's not in me. God will give you, right? God will give. So he later tells Pharaoh that God has revealed, God will bring this about. Joseph is not attributing success, and he had lots of it. He's not attributing that to himself. He is making it very clear where the power in his life comes from, right? He's making it very clear who it is, orchestrating all of these circumstances to shape his life and shape his heart into who he wants him to be and where he wants him to go. Joseph recognizes that the Lord is with him. And so he is quick to attribute success, not to himself, but to the Lord. That's why he's so humble, right? We see humility here toward Pharaoh. You know, when we love ourselves more than God, what's the fruit of that? Pride. I mean, think about that. 
If you love yourself or, or one of those idols I mentioned earlier, if something else is truly your supreme love and you're, you're obeying that, right? You want that to be elevated in your life and not a relationship with the Lord himself, well, then pride takes over. Pride becomes what truly defines our, our attitude, our words, right? We do this. We do this because we have to continually promote ourselves and try to make ourselves look better to others than we actually know we are inside our hearts. We know we have issues. We know that we're sad and discouraged, but we don't want other people to think that or see a glimpse of that. And so we will do all kinds of things to promote ourselves through our pride because ultimately it all goes back to what? Our supreme love is not God himself, it's ourselves. And so we have to promote ourselves. We do this, you know? Like I think a practical example, you know, when you're talking to somebody and at some point in the conversation, you know, we all do this, right? We try to find a way to like compliment ourselves, you know, or let them know about something great that we've done. Oh yeah, well, you know, high school, that was a long time ago. I was a starting quarterback though. You know, like we, we, we do that. We, we just throw little compliments to ourselves in conversation. I was not a starting quarterback. I was using that as an illustration, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, <laughs> but we do this because if our supreme love is ourselves, it really does become evident in just the way we talk to other people, the way we kind of carry ourselves, our disposition. But when God is our greatest love, the goal of our lives is consciously, consciously to point other people to him and not us. Do you see Joseph doing that? He tells Pharaoh, Pharaoh's like, man, Joseph, you're awesome. I've never seen anybody that can do what you can do. I'm gonna put you in charge of everything. I mean, Joseph easily, he easily could have been like, oh yeah, you know, give, it, give me the power. I'll, absolutely, yeah, well, I mean, I tried. You know, I tried hard, right? No, Joseph is like, it's not me. It's not in me, it is God himself, Pharaoh. And he's talking, by the way, to a pagan ruler who did not believe in the God of the Bible. So Joseph is a good witness to him as well. That's what we see here, though. It's humility. It's humility characterizing his life through a supreme love for God. He doesn't have to promote himself. He has everything he could ever want in his relationship with God. Number three. We see Joseph demonstrating this character by using his knowledge and resources to help others, right? Think about that. Joseph had great wisdom. <clears throat> he had a gift from God to interpret dreams. He had great organizational and leadership skills. I mean, the guy came up with a 14-year plan, like, on the spot, right? And it was wonderful, and it worked, and it saved the whole nation and others from starvation. But he didn't have to do that. You know, like he could have been bitter. I would have been bitter if I was wrongly imprisoned for two years. I would have been angry at all the Egyptians. Joseph isn't an Egyptian. He owes them nothing. He's a Hebrew sold into slavery, falsely imprisoned. He didn't have to share this knowledge. He could have kept that knowledge to himself about the famine. He could have told Pharaoh that his dream meant something totally wrong, totally different. He could have used that bitterness and resentment to get even with the Egyptian nation. He could have withheld his knowledge. He could have hoarded all the extra food. Even if he had devised this plan, he could have kept all the food and not allowed people from around the world, which that's what happened, by the way. People from neighboring countries were coming to Egypt because they had so much food stored up. And Joseph blessed them with it and allowed them to purchase it. But he didn't have to do that. But what? Because God was his supreme love. Not his ego, not his reputation, not his desire to get back at somebody or get ahead of anyone. He used his knowledge that God gave him. He used his resources that God gave him to do what? To bless others, to serve others. Generosity defined him because his supreme love, God himself, is the ruler over all of creation and has all the riches of heaven. 
And if we know we're going to inherit that, boy, we can open our hands a little easier, can't we? If we know that in eternity, we're going to inherit the kingdom of heaven and all the riches of glory alongside Jesus Christ, worshiping him forever, loving one another forever in a perfect place, can't we be a little more open then in this life with our knowledge, with our resources to help others because we're not in the business of hoarding anything in this life for ourselves. Because you're not going to take any of that with you when you die. If we were truly living for God and his kingdom, stinginess would not define us. If we had eternity on our minds instead of just the comforts of today and what's in front of us and building our own little kingdom, if we really believed in our hearts the kingdom that we are living for, an eternal kingdom, we would be so much more generous. Generous with our time. Gener generous with our knowledge, like Joseph was. Generous with our money. Generous with our willingness. Our, just, our willingness to take the time to help. To help those in need, to serve someone else. You know, Paul talked about this in Philippians 2, Verses three and four, he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. You see, only when we love God more than our own ambitions are we really free, are we free then to love others with this kind of generosity. You know, I want to be very clear. Joseph was not a perfect man. Joseph had his flaws. Joseph was a sinful man who does not deserve God's grace, just like any of us do not deserve God's grace. But we, we see here something, don't we? Don't we see actual fruit here, though, in his life? And that godly character that we see by fleeing temptation, humble attitude, generosity, serving others, what is all that pointing to? It's pointing to the fact that, you know what? Joseph does love the Lord. He loves God with all his heart, and mind, and soul more than anything else. And that is why, that is why his life was defined by godliness and integrity. You see, this story of Joseph is great. It's pretty good. He's a good example. But I think if we look even closer, we see that the life of Joseph is actually pointing us to someone even greater. You see, like Joseph, many years later, Jesus Christ would be betrayed by people who loved him. And he would be a servant to others. Like Joseph, Jesus would be tempted. And he would overcome and be victorious. Like Joseph, Jesus was condemned unjustly for something he didn't do. And like Joseph, Jesus' aim was to please God the Father and was obedient and faithful through every difficult circumstance. And you remember? Remember the Egyptians? What did we read earlier? When Joseph passed by in his chariot, what would they do? They would bow, bow the knee, it says. Bow the knee. I want to read something to you. I want to continue what we just stopped in Philippians 2, verse 5. Paul is telling the Philippian church, to be humble, to put the interest of others before our own. And why? Why? Because look at this. Philippians 2, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he 
humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the gospel. That is the good news. That Jesus can be our greatest love. Because he humbled himself. Hey, the example of Joseph is great. But the example of Jesus is perfect. That he humbled himself and took the form of a lowly servant and endured all the pain and the ridicule and the mistreatment and the injustice that you could ever imagine. And he did that because he loves you. He did that because he wants you. And some of you don't believe that. Some of you don't believe that God really wants you. Some of you don't believe that he wants you to live with him forever because you say, well, pastor, I have done something that is so bad and I'm ashamed of it and it's hard for me to even walk in a church. And I don't know that the Lord can really forgive me. And I would say back to you that, well, that's a little prideful of you to think that you're a greater judge than God himself and that you hold all the power of judgment in the world. And so you're harshly judging yourself more than even God because he wants you to confess your sin and turn to him and run to him for forgiveness so that he can display his grace in your heart. Some of you love the Lord and you're just beat up by the circumstances of your life and it's been a difficult road and you're trying really hard to be obedient. There may be temptation there may be false accusation. Someone may have legitimately wronged you. And you feel like you can't catch a break, sort of like Joseph. But I know this, that the Lord loves those who persevere and whose faith points to the fact that their hearts are sold out to him and not themselves. And if he is your supreme love, he will bless you don't doubt that. He will bless you and he will lead you and he will carry you through all your darkest days. If we flee from our sin, if we flee from ourselves and in humility trust Christ, then a beautiful thing happens. His record of righteousness replaces our record of sin. His righteousness is given to us. It's accredited to our account. If you need to talk to someone today about what that looks like, and just talk to someone about where you, where you are currently, where your heart is, then please do not hesitate to reach out to me, one of our staff members. We want, we want to talk to you about that, and we would love to, to sit down and, and have that conversation. Maybe today you were moved by the baptisms you saw and the testimonies you heard, and maybe that's you. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you've never followed, or, uh, followed through with that. Maybe it's time for you to make a commitment and really join this family of God. Maybe you already are a member here of this family here at Kernan, and the truth is you've been hoarding your own knowledge. Maybe you've been hoarding your resources, and it's time to go all in. It's time to jump in and say, I want to live for the kingdom and not myself whatever the case is, I just want you to know that the Lord is with you. He was with Joseph. He had a plan. Joseph was obedient through the darkest of days. And the same can be true for us if he's truly our supreme love. We can be obedient because of that power, not us, 
but his powerful love in us that transforms us and displays his goodness to this world. Can we live like that? We have to ask his help. We have to ask the Holy Spirit to do that in us. Can we do that now? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I'm thankful for the fact that you never give up on us. Lord, you should have given up on me a long time ago. But I'm grateful that your loving hand is with us as it was with Joseph. And Lord, nobody in here is trying to pretend like life is easy or that the Christian life is easy. It's extremely difficult to go against the grain, to go against this world, the temptations we face every day, the pressure to be somebody that we're not. But Lord, would you be our supreme love? Lord, would you be our supreme love? And just melt away any other desires that are ruling over us so that the fruit of our lives would bring glory to your name and be a glimpse a glimpse of what is to come when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that you are the Lord and Savior of all so Lord may our lives be a glimpse of that, a continual bowing of the knee to the one who truly reigns. Jesus, would you be our supreme love? It's in your name we pray.